Last night, we saw the original team that had issues way back when. It feels like a long time ago, but it was week three when the Titans played the Vikings that after that game, they were thrown into disarray for a couple of weeks. They actually played better back then. Now that everything's settled down, the Titans have stepped into a hole. They're one and three in their last four games, and the Indianapolis Colts, by the identical score, I identical score to last Thursday night when the Packers beat the 49ers 34-17. The Colts beat the Titans 34-17, powered by a second half where the Colts just grabbed the Titans by the shirt collar and dragged them around wherever they wanted them to go, Peter. What I thought was really interesting about the game, two things really. I mean, Frank Reich said, uh, essentially, um, I am going to reprise Doug Peterson 2017. When I was in Philadelphia, I learned, don't be afraid. You know, go ahead, go for it. So they go for it on five fourth downs last night, make it three times, I think. And the other thing that interested me in this game is that I think the depth of the roster that Chris Ballard has built in Indianapolis is really showing up because last night the best player for the Indianapolis Colts was Naheem Hines and you say well you know that's not that much of a shark well he was entering training camp at best the third running back on this team uh you know after they drafted Jonathan Taylor and I really thought coming into this season that Jonathan Taylor had a great shot to be the offensive rookie of the year in the NFL. But what has happened is that Frank Wright basically has watched his games and has watched, first of all, not just how elusive Naheem Hines is, but how smart he is. He's got a little bit, Mike, of Le'Veon Bell in him where he doesn't just charge into a hole. You see, you know, Derrick Henry can charge into any hole. He can be a bull in in a china shop and get away with it. Whereas Naeem Hines, obviously a smaller guy, has to pick and choose a little bit, but he's fast enough to get out on the edge and to make da- make some uh, damaging things happen. I think he had 115 total yards last night. He was uh, a huge piece of the puzzle that won that game. And a pair of touchdowns on his birthday. He had a couple of touchdowns a few weeks ago in a win over the Detroit Lions. Here's Frank Reich after the game talking about his unlikely star tailback. He just came out and he just, he just had fire in his eye. I can't explain it. Coach Rathman came up to me on the sideline and said, Naheem is on fire. And I said, leave him in. You know, I said, leave him in. We'll just give him a break when he needs a break, but let's, let's ride it. Um, He was, he came out ready to play and he, he always does, but every now and then, you know how it is. You're in the zone. You got a little extra juice and, Naheem had that today, so look look great out there. You know, that's the challenge of using multiple running backs. Every once in a while, one of them is going to be, for whatever reason, and maybe it was his birthday, but for whatever reason, one of them is going to be at a different level than the others, and you have to be willing to pivot to that guy if your staff senses it, and it pays off. It helps you win the game, Peter. Yeah, and that's, I'll tell you, the one thing about Frank Reich as a a head coach is, you know, some head coaches say, this is our philosophy, this is what we're doing, and they don't seem very willing to change it at all. And I think coming into this year, what I said was right. It was going to be Marlon Mack, Jonathan Taylor, with Naheem Hines as a change-up back. But what has happened is, especially without Mack, you know, Frank Reich and obviously Tom Rathman, they have to look for a combination that keeps the running game strong. And the only reason I remember talking to Frank Reich about this in the off season, you know, when he was talking about drafting a running back so high, he said, we will run the ball. We will run the ball. And I think that became apparent last night when you just kept thinking, boy, when are they going to start hitting some home runs here? And they didn't need to. The one other thing I think about this this game, Mike, that is so interesting is that almost in the blink of an eye, you know, we both thought, I'm sure, two, three weeks ago even, that Tennessee was winning this division. 
And Tennessee still might win this division. But last night, offense, defense, and special teams. Tennessee's special teams killed them last night. Another miss, the eighth miss field goal by Steven Gostowski. The block punt, the 12-yard punt. That's as bad a special teams night as anybody's had in the NFL this year. Yeah, and that's really when the pendulum swung sharply in the Colts' favor. It was that 27-yard shankopotamus, as you would call it, from the punter that gave the Colts the short field. They score the touchdown, and then lightning strikes with the block punt, and a 17-13 lead by the Titans becomes a 27-17 deficit in less than a minute of clock time. And that's that for the Tennessee Titans. That's it. So... Uh, it, it, it it happens quickly sometimes. You know, the Titans get into these grinded out, grinded out, grinded out games. But if you give up 14 points as fast as they did last night, it's almost impossible to overcome. And uh, that 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 is going to make it harder for the Titans to reestablish themselves. I mean, they were 5-0. And, oh, and every year we see a team or two that has that really hot start, that creates that buzz. And then all of a sudden it pops. And before you know it, they're scratching and clawing for a playoff spot. And it, it feels like the Titans in the AFC and the Bears in the NFC combined 10-1 and one to start the season. Now a combined 10 and – wait, the Titans have six wins, right? The Titans are now 6-3. and three. Titans um, are 6-3, and these, three, yeah. These damn – these damn bye weeks, for some reason, they're messing me up more this year than any other year. How many games has a team played? But – but the Titans at six and three, and the Bears at five and four. After starting five and zero, oh and the Bears five and one, we just we see that dynamic, and and I think as it begins to disintegrate, it's hard to get it back. You don't know what you have to do to get back to where you were. Mike, the one thing I would not have expected. Let's go back to that Houston game. <clears throat> after the game last night, I stayed up and I did a little did a little bit of math, but uh, on a few things, but. What I find interesting and, and problematic, quite frankly, uh, for the Titans, it, half of their season, to me, has been totally unacceptable on defense. Over the last five games, including that win over Houston that was the, you know, the barn burner, the 42-36 game, you know, half of the, that's half their season now. They've allowed 20, 29 points a game on average. And that is not a Mike Vrabel team at all. And so that is one of the things that has to change. Are there going to be a quick out in the playoffs, I think, in January? Yeah, if they even get there. And at this current pace of losing three out of four games, they won't get there. Here's Vrabel after the game talking about what needs to happen to get the Titans back on track. Well, here we go. Vrabel now. Mike Vrabel. Everything's going to have to change when you don't play well. I mean, you got to coach better and got to play better. That, that's really what it is, Jim, and um, that's what we'll have to do. You know, we'll have to take a couple of days off here, get healthy, um, take, take a good hard look at, uh, you know, what we did and what we're doing, you know, and continue to try to, uh, to improve. You know, we got to play complementary football in all three phases, and that, you know, doesn't happen for 60 minutes right now. Yeah, it really has gotten bad for the Tennessee Titans. And and it's not that they were blown off the field wire to wire. I think that's what makes it even worse. The idea that there's this, this possibility that it's going to short circuit at any given moment and and it's just gone and you can't get it back because you don't have the offense to come from behind. Now, look, they, they gave the Steelers a run for their money when they were down 27 to 7 and they made it very interesting but typically this isn't an offense that's going to score a ton of points and we saw what happened last night when it was 27 to 17 i felt like you could shut off the lights at that point so you know derrick henry's been neutralized after he had such a great start to the season ryan Tannehill is still very good but he doesn't have that aura of greatness around him and and how much can an offense really do to prop up a defense, Peter, that simply isn't getting it done? At some point, it is going to manifest itself in the performance of your quarterback. His numbers are going to drop. Even though maybe his abilities haven't changed at all, he's just in tougher spots. It's a, it's a harder game to play if your defense is allowing so many points and putting you in difficult situations repeatedly. 
the one thing I've noticed with the Titans, Mike, and, and Ryan Tannehill in recent weeks, um, look, the last two weeks he's a 48% passer, which obviously you would think is sort of fluky uh, and probably won't continue because he's been so incredibly accurate uh, in the last year plus. But the other thing that bothers me about their offense is that this has not been an explosive offense. The one stat that, the one commonly uh, uh, kept stat, uh, yards per attempt, which over a one-year period, uh, Ryan Tannehill, as of a couple of weeks ago, was number one in the NFL over the prior 16 games. And the last, like, three games, he's been poor in that. And so to me, I think even though, I mean, I love Arthur Smith's play calling. Last night, especially the play calling on the little jet sweep surprise thing where you thought uh, when they were at the one that they were going to bang Derrick Henry in there and then they just prance in for an easy touchdown. I think it was Jonu Smith. I mean, those are the smart things that you can do um, as a play caller. I think Arthur Smith has got to start challenging teams more down the field than Tennessee has in the last two or three weeks. You know, it was funny in the pregame show, Jake Glazer was touting Arthur Smith as a potential candidate to be a head coach elsewhere next year. And, and these narratives get locked in based on what happens early in the season to stay on that short list of people who are mentioned as candidates. And we know that the owners listen to that and they make their lists off of the names that percolate through the media. You got to finish the year. You got to keep it going. You got to get to the playoffs. You've got to be a guy that has that glow that lasts more than just a month and a half. And the Titans are fighting to keep any semblance of glow. Phillip Rivers and the Colts, on the other hand, now six and three. They've been inconsistent throughout the course of the year, but here they are technically atop the AFC South because they have the same record as the Titans. They play again in just two weeks. They get a chance to sweep the Titans at home, which will make it very difficult for the Titans to win the division. Here's Phillip Rivers on where they are and where the Indianapolis Colts need to go. But it just felt like we were dialed in and ready to go. So th this performance from our team doesn't surprise any of us. Um, but as we know, and as you always hear me say, it's a week-to-week league. It's a week -to -week league. So uh, we can enjoy it for a little bit, uh, get this mini buy, and then we got the Green Bay Packers coming to, coming to our place. So this is just uh, this this was a big win, but we know there's a long way to go. That Green Bay Colts game moved to 4:25 p.m. Eastern, and for good reason. Both teams doing extremely well, and I got to give the Colts credit, Peter, for not letting Sunday's loss to the Ravens hover over them. They shrugged it off because that was a game that it felt like they were going to win disappointing, deflating, and kudos to Frank Reich to get his guys to reset, forget about it, focus on the Titans on a short week on the road and get it done. And along the way, Phillip Rivers, he had over 300 passing yards last night. Well, it only took four to leapfrog Dan Marino for fifth place all time on the career passing yardage list. And he's a dozen or so away from catching Marino on the all-time passing touchdown list so there's the top six right now and he's got a long way to go he's gonna have to play at least two more years to have a shot at catching Brett Favre and I don't think Rivers is gonna play at least two more years but to get ahead of Dan Marino is a hell of an accomplishment because you know that that's the guy when he retired we thought he'd, he'd hold that record for a lot longer than he did yeah, I remember going to the game uh, where Marino set the all-time passing yardage mark. It was uh, in Miami, uh, whatever year it was. But I'll never forget after that game, the Dolphins lost the game. And uh, their PR guy, Harvey Green, handed Dan Marino the, st you know, the, the, the game book and just said, you know, you might want to have this. And the Dolphins lost. Marino took the game book. And he went, <laughs> and he just tossed it aside. Uh, because to him, I, the thing with Dan Marino was, and I'm sure Philip Rivers, I, I would think he would say the same thing. You know, numbers, w what really are they? I mean, I, this is nothing against Philip Rivers, but there aren't going to be a lot of people who've watched football their whole lives who are going to say that Philip Rivers is better than Dan Marino. 
uh, and, and that doesn't demean his talent, diminish him in any way as a player. But to me, Dan Marino is one of the best 10 quarterbacks who ever lived. And he played at a time, if he played today, what would his numbers be? I don't know, but they would be incredibly gaudy. And they would be a lot more than whatever he was on that list, 61,000 or whatever it is. And that's why sometimes when you hear those things, you just say, okay, modern football. You know, but they're really not, to me, all that meaningful. But doesn't that become at least one extra little plank in the Hall of Fame case for Philip Rivers? Like, I'm kind of lukewarm. Oh, sure on it does. Because he, sure. in his own era, he didn't really stand out. But if you finish top five in touchdown passes and passing yardage all time, that, that gives that, that sense that he belongs in Canton a bit of a boost. Yeah, there's no question about it. But what I am saying is that, you know, in some ways, Mike, you know, passing yardage totals uh, have become a little bit like Pro Bowl berths. You know, do you really think about them the way you used to? I know I don't. When I go in and look and sit in the Hall of Fame room the day before the uh, uh, the Super Bowl every year, and people start rattling off, well, he made such and such Pro Bowls. Well, if it's a guy who played in the 60s or 70s, I tend to give it a little bit more credit. Today, I just think it's jokey because either you make the Pro Bowl and you don't want to go anyway, so now 105 people make the Pro Bowl every year, um, or, you know, I think the voting is ridiculously flawed for the Pro Bowl, and uh, but whatever. I do think that you have to look at the one thing that I respect a lot. I respect longevity. And the fact is that Phillip Rivers, especially if he leads this team to the playoffs, they win a game maybe two. You know, I respect somebody having longevity in the sport, continuing to play at a high level. Uh, and I think that'll hold him in good stead when one day he... His case is heard for Canton. Can we put the graphic back up of the current top six passing yardage leaders in NFL history? Because I have one final point I'd like to make on that. And as to your Pro Bowl point, Peter, this year we won't have a Pro Bowl team ultimately with 100 Good. players because there's no game that's going to be played. It's just going to be the Pro Bowl team announced. Look at these six names. These guys better enjoy where they are on the list while they can because it's just a matter of time before Patrick Mahomes knocks all of them down a peg from where they are. He got to 10,000 yards faster than anyone in league history. He did it in 34 games. So keep playing as long as you can. Drew Brees and Tom Brady, it's not going to matter. Mahomes is eventually going to be the guy at the top as long as his health permits him to play and as long as he chooses to play, although I have no reason to think he won't choose to play. Okay, so let's talk about the Colts and Titans a little bit more before we take a break. The Colts have the Packers next and then the Titans again. I, hey, you know, as I said, the Colts have been inconsistent this year. And even though they've been inconsistent, they've gotten to six and three. And they're right now at the edge of that conversation of a team that could be a problem in the postseason. Maybe this year's version of the Titans that goes in to a Kansas City or a Baltimore and pulls off an upset in the divisional round. Last year, the Colts beat the Chiefs at Arrowhead Stadium during the regular season. Very different circumstances, but still, the organization is capable of going in there and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chiefs, and they're arguably better than they were at any point last year. It's going to get interesting for these teams. I, I think both have the potential, clearly, to get to the playoffs. The Titans are the ones who need to, to right the ship the most, but look at the, the upcoming games. They've got some good teams on the schedule, and they've got to reestablish themselves quickly. And then the next challenge comes when they go back to Baltimore, where they did what they did in the divisional round last year and stunned the Ravens. And that actually may work against them now because, Peter, you know John Harbaugh and company have been looking forward to the opportunity to, to get a little payback on the Titans for what they did to their 2019 season. Yeah, the benefit the Titans are going to have is that they will go into that game significantly more rested and the Ravens will be back in Baltimore at 3 o'clock in the morning on uh, Sunday night after playing, you know, the Sunday night game at New England this week. So as far as being rested, I think, you know, the Titans have an advantage there. But, 
hey, look, it's not going to help the Titans if they're if they don't play any better. We never talk about special teams really very much, Mike, but I think Mike Vrabel's got a big decision to make. I think he's got to decide if he can live with the inconsistency of Steven Guskowski, and I think he's got to decide if he can live with a punter um, who, and look, it certainly wasn't his fault that the punt was blocked, but whose thoughts have to be swimming now after the shanked punt right before he got the punt blocked. So I would not be surprised if the Titans have a new punter and a new kicker by the time they face the Ravens a week from Sunday. I remember Jimmy Johnson's very strongly held belief that special teams equate to a full third of the game, even though the emphasis isn't supplied the way that it is to offense and defense. It swings field position. It creates points. It surrenders points. And it can provide that lightning strike that turns a victory into a defeat like it did last night. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.